Have you ever wondered about if your printer wants to kidding you? I mean, those machines really don't work when we need them most. And I slightly believe that, uh, yeah, they li literally can smell stress and anxiousness. And probably they like to make us having pain. Of course, this is just a joke. But this joke contains an interesting thought or interesting question. Is there more in this machine, more than the electronic parts it is built with? Maybe some own mind. Again, considering only a printer. This question is fun too. But what if we consider machines which are far more complex what if we consider systems like the big supercomputers or the World Wide Web? Or, because it's most recent, what if we consider artificial intelligence? I mean, artificial intelligence um, is good in tasks uh, where we thought maybe 20 years ago uh, it could never be done by machines. So. I assume, or I argue, that we should ask if such, such machines could have something like our own mind, our own conscious experience. But before going deeper into this question, I want to ask, what is actually an intelligent machine? Well, explaining machines itself it's pretty easy, or we, are, we know what machines are. We use machines or tools for thousands of years. We use them to go hunting, to build a house, uh, for cooking or farm work. Or most recently, we use machines to, to go around the planet, to drive to work. Or we use tools and machines even for tasks we wouldn't be able to do without them, for example, leaving planet Earth to go to the moon. But what is an intelligent machine? Well, of course, again, there are many different definitions for intelligence itself and also for artificial intelligence. But for now, I guess it's enough to say, OK, these are tools or machines which are working somehow independently and perform good in tasks, like I explained before, uh, what we thought only humans could do. For example, yeah, simple explanation like um, playing uh, chess or playing the game Go, or driving cars or recognizing uh, cats and dogs on an image. But it could also be that in future such machines, or it will be, will also take over tasks which are much more complex. And that's uh, where people are uh, getting afraid of. And to, I want to explain you how these algorithms are working exactly. I put it together in one slide. It's basically nothing else as mass statistics, logic, and of course, a lot of computing power. And of course, the algorithms behind it, like uh, deep neural ne networks, for example, are pretty genius, and the engineers are genius too, building it. But I argue that you can boil down everything to those aspects. And for our discussion, it's uh, kind of important. Because if you put everything into math and statistics and so on, you also have to put reality, physics, into computable, computable code or computable signals, digital data. What does it mean? Well, take an image. An image is like a momentum of a current moment. And these are nothing else than uh, information about color and ordered in a, in a special sequence. And this serves as, as something like an input. Or where it becomes more important is if you consider uh, the goal of the artificial intelligence. You also have to quantify the goal. Currently, I 
I would argue that most uh, artificial intelligences out there, or maybe all, uh, used to optimize a problem. What does it mean? Well, recognizing a cat or a dog on an image is math mathematically an optimization problem. You want to get better in recognizing cats and dogs. And maybe for cats and dogs, or playing chess or driving a car, this is maybe a solvable problem. But what happens when you consider solving such a problem uh, for, or what if you consider if you want to learn an artificial intelligence which is happy, which has moral, which has feelings, which um, tries to develop real love, how to put such problems into computable code, into optimization problems. So things which are not touchable, where also we human beings not really know how to quantify it, how to quantify moral happiness and so on. I guess that are really big problems in future, and I'm not sure if we can solve all of them. But just imagine that we are really able to build an artificial intelligence, which is totally, totally like you and me, which has human-like intelligence. What, what does this mean? Well, I imagine a situation when I walk into a bar and I know, okay, there's a machine sitting next to me and I have a nice talk with this machine. And after a while, I'm surprised because I, I will forget that I am talking with an artificial intelligence. And I, I probably ask, okay, machine, I have to ask you a question. Are you even conscious about yourself? Do you know that you, you talk to me or that you are thinking? Do you have a conscious experience? And I use a quote from the movie Transcendence with Johnny Depp, and the machine could ask me, well, that's a good question. And I want to ask you back, are you conscious about myself? Probably naively, I will answer, yes, of course, I'm conscious about myself. And then the machine could answer again, well, then um, prove me. Prove me that you are conscious about myself. And then I probably would have a problem because I don't know how, how could I prove that I'm conscious. It's not enough to show that uh, I, I, I'm moving around and stuff because I could be a robot too or it could be a simulation or could be in the matrix. So how could I show or prove that I'm conscious? I decided to work on this question maybe two or two and a half years ago, and I realized fastly that there are millions of theories and opinions of explanations about consciousness. What is consciousness? And they reach from, hey, consciousness is only an illusion, uh, it's not worth discussing about it, up to the theories that consciousness is everywhere, not just in living, living animals, also in a piece of paper, in the Himalayas, in the air, everywhere. For me as a scientist, this not really helps to answer questions if a machine has real consciousness. So when I want to prove something, I, I, I need to observe something and I decided, okay, I need a, a starting point. So what is a good way to start? And I decided to start with me, or like René Descartes said, I think, therefore, I am. It's maybe not the best starting point, and there are discussions about this quote. But I, I want to explain uh, why this is a good one. So what did, it, did he mean? I think, therefore, I am. Well, in modern language, you could translate this sentence into, yeah, I'm able to make experiences. And that fact allows me to say that I really exist. I give you an example. Imagine that you are sitting in the theaters and watching a movie. But the movie is not something made in Hollywood. The movie are your own thoughts, which describe your perception or what is going on in your brain. And even if those 
is the movie, those thoughts, or those perceptions, is an illusion, or is a dream, or is the matrix. You're still in the situation where you realize that you can observe this experience. And according to Descartes, this is consciousness, and this is the only thing we can be totally sure about in our lives. Everything else could be an illusion. Well, that's, it's a, that's a good starting point. Why? Because I want to prove consciousness inside myself. And I have the only truth inside myself. So, but how can I show you that I'm consciousness? So, if I want to prove something, I need to observe it, and I can observe something if I measure it. If I measure temperature, it's easy, because uh, we have tools to do this. Or if I measure how there's a distance between my two fingers, it's, it's easy, because we can measure it too, and it's existing in the physical world, it's objective. But consciousness is not really objective, it's totally sub subjective, so you cannot touch, so it's probably impossible to measure. But there is a guy called Giulio Tononi who invented in this field a famous theory, the integrated information theory, who tries to measure consciousness. And you have to know, Tononi is a guy, he is a neuroscientist and does research with sleeping patients and coma patients. And if there is lying someone, he want to know, is he somehow in his brain conscious or he, is he already brain dead? So a really important question. And he made a tweak with this theory. He knew there are facts about consciousness. For example, uh, like Descartes said, that I know that I'm existing, so there must be something physical. And there are Four other facts, like information, integration, composition, and existence. Uh, it's too complex now to explain. But he used these called axioms and thought about, OK, I know something about consciousness. So how has to be a physical system be structured to give rise to consciousness? So he transformed such rules and thought about, okay, how should we build or should a physical system like an organism, like you and me, be built uh, to give rise to consciousness? And then he was able to yeah, construct some measures. So he was able theoretically to measure consciousness. And there is one aspect in the theory which is pretty interesting uh, to understand consciousness itself better, and it's the fact about information, or better, intrinsic information. What is it? Well, information we know as sender and receiver information. This means I send you a message, you receive it, and that's information for you. But in this case, information uh, can be more, or is better to understandable if you take the Latin definition, like informare, to form, to shape, to make. This means that inside your head, you form, shape, and make your own experience, your own consciousness. This means if you shut down everything from the outside, you still have something, some flow of experience, some flow of consciousness inside your head, uh, which gives you your current experience. So you could be in a room there is nothing, everything is black, you cannot feel anything, you will not hear anything, and you still have consciousness. So how does this theory help us to answer if machines could be conscious? Well, there are two scenarios. One scenario is that we perfectly rebuild human consciousness, so as a software. Imagine there is an engineer developing a software called consciousness.exe and he runs it on a computer and um, there is a software where we can talk with and it's intelligent too. This would still be just a software, a simulation. It's like running a simulation of an earthquake on a computer. It will not turn to be real. 
Of course, it's frightening to have a total simulation of a human on a computer, but it's still just a simulation. It's not real. So, no, a simulation do not have, doesn't have real consciousness. And the second scenario is that, yeah, we take the machine itself, so the hardware, like CPU and memory, and if we make it complex enough, it could give rise to consciousness. If we take current machines, current computers probably are not really conscious. So, because their information flow, like I tried to explain before, is not existent, and the information, the parts it is built with are not integrated, that would be necessary to give rise to real consciousness. But this doesn't exclude that it could be possible to build a real artificial consciousness in future. Because if we take such rules uh, for consciousness and, for example, yeah, create artificially a machine, it could give rise to consciousness. Or the second scenario, which I believe is more, more proper if we take a time frame of 1,000 years, is what if we build an AI, a machine, who really um, yeah, evolves itself, then I believe it could be really be possible then we have something syn synthetical which has real consciousness. But to, to stay more recent and for those who build really human artificial intelligence or try to rebuild humans, I, I want to let the keep in mind that everything they try to optimize has to be calculatable. And does it really, really make sense to divide our, our whole life into calculable problems? Or would that mean that maybe we have really a problem in our life? Thank you. <laughs>